things and what they mean and how one can uh, interpret them will also be worked into this. For those that weren't here yesterday, I will give a very brief uh, summary. And then I will turn to my <coughs> overall subject uh, with the provocative title, Has Capitalism Seen Its Day? I will, uh, make a I, I will propose a crisis theory of uh, uh, contemporary capitalism. And I am daring enough to say that at this point, we can uh, claim uh, that this social configuration uh, is on the way out. This is, however, not uh, a, a, uh, an optimistic uh, <laughs> statement. Uh, what, what, I will, uh, what, what I will present to you as a, a probable scenario is a long period of indecision, uh, uh, crisis, anomie, uh, disorder, and all these bad things. And at the end, you'll give us a ray of hope. You will do this. Uh, <laughs> Eric, this is for you. That's, we, that's our vision for you. of labor. Uh, <laughs> it's not an education, it's in sociology. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, so I, I begin by uh, uh, drawing our attention to the fact that there is a widespread sense today that capitalism is in critical condition, and more so than ever uh, since the end of the Second World War. Uh, looking back, the, the crash of 2008 was only the latest in a long sequence of political and economic disorders that began with the end of the post-war prosperity in the mid-1970s. Successive crises turned out to be ever more severe, spreading more widely and rapidly through an increasingly interconnected global economy. We discussed this yesterday, uh, going to Arrighi and, and his uh, sequential theory of financialization. Uh, global inflation in the 1970s was followed by rising public debt in the 1980s, and fiscal consolidation in the 1990s was accompanied by a steep increase in private sector indebtedness. That's, uh, that we showed yesterday. For four decades now, this equilibrium has more or less been the normal conditions of OECD capitalism, both at the national and the global levels. In fact, with time, the crises of post-war capitalism have become so pervasive that they are increasingly perceived as more than just economic in nature. In a rediscovery of the older notion of a capitalist society, of capitalism as a social order and way of life, vitally dependent on uninterrupted progress of private capital accumulation. Crisis symptoms are many, among them three long-term trends in the trajectories of rich, advanced, highly industrialized, or better increasingly deindustrialized capitalist economies. Now, I need my... <laughs> it's coming! <laughs> I in my first slide. The first, the, those of you who were here saw, the, saw most of them yesterday, but I just want to, uh, to draw them back to your attention. The first is a persistent decline. Yeah, he's coming. In the rate of <laughs> economic growth. OK. Now we only need to put this, okay, okay, no, just move it up here, no problem, no, no, he, he knows what he's doing, he, is, he has this uh, certainty in his uh, <laughs> general manners, which, which indicates that he knows what he's doing. <laughs> I, I knew you, 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 I knew you would do this. Uh, in the rate of economic growth, recently aggravated by the events of 2008. The second, and associated with the first, the second trend, is an equally persistent increase in the overall indebtedness among leading capitalist economies. We discussed this graph yesterday. It is the indebtedness of the American economy. But we can also look at the general government debt as a percentage of GDP, which we also 
talked about yesterday in, in, in OECD countries from 1970 to 2011. And thirdly, uh, an increase in uh, uh, social inequality uh, of both in, in income and wealth has been on the rise for several decades now, alongside rising debt, alongside rising debt and declining growth. Steady growth, sound money, and a modicum of social equity spreading some of the benefits of capitalism to those without capital were long considered prerequisites for a capitalist political economy commanding the legitimacy it needs. What must be most alarming from, the perspect from this perspective is that the three critical trends that I have mentioned may be mutually reinforcing. There is mounting evidence that increasing inequality may be one of the causes of declining growth for Keynesian reasons as well as for supply-side reasons, productivity and, and, and so on. Uh, as inequality both impedes improvement in productivity and weakens demand. Low growth, in turn, reinforces inequality by intensifying distributional conflict, making concessions to the poor more costly for the rich, and making the rich insist more than before on strict observance of the so-called St. Matthew principle governing free markets. I don't I don't assume that you are uh, readers of the Bible, but uh, St. Matthew, here I have the quote, for unto everyone that has shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that has, that has not, shall be taken even that which he has. So that's what Robert Merton, uh, in, in a famous essay, calls the principle of cumulative advantage, uh, which is something that is uh, operative in markets, unless some corrective action is being taken. And, and I'm glad that Thomas Piketty has sort of uh, made this uh, perfectly clear in this book, Capital in the 21st Century. Um, also, rising debt, while failing to halt the decline of economic growth, adds to inequality through the structural changes associated with financialization. And there's a long literature about this too now. Financialization, in turn, helped compensate wage earners and consumers for the growing income inequality caused by stagnant wages and cutbacks in public services. This is what uh, Colin Crouch called uh, uh, privatized uh, uh, Keynesianism. Uh, can what appears to be a vicious, circle, a vicious circle of downward trends continue forever? Are there counterforces that might break it up? And what will happen if they fail to materialize, as they have for almost four decades now? That's the subject of what I'm going to talk Historians inform us that crises are nothing, are nothing new under capitalism and may, in fact, have be required for its longer-term good health. But in the German term for this is Reinigungskrise, a purgatory crisis. But what they are talking about are cyclical movements or random shocks after which capitalist economies can move into a new equilibrium, at least temporarily. What we are seeing today, however, as we look back, is a continuous process of gradual decay on those three uh, fundamental indicators, protracted, but apparently all the more inexorable. Recovery from the occasional Reinigungskrise is one thing breaking a concatenation of intertwined long-term trends quite another. Assuming that ever lower growth, ever higher inequality, and ever rising debt are not indefinitely uh, sustainable and may together issue in a crisis that is systemic in nature, one will have difficulty imagining what it would be like, and I will <laughs> say something on this, can we see signs of an impending reversal? Here, the news are not good. Four, five years have passed since 2008, almost uh, uh, six, the culmination so far of the post-war crisis sequence. That sequence, to remind you, uh, uh, inflation, public debt, uh, overall 
in indebtedness. Uh, coming each of these uh, crisis uh, periods, roughly 10 years, uh, where, where what is significant for them was, first of all, a solution to a problem, inflation is a solution to distribution of problems, which became itself a problem in dialectical Marxist uh, ways, then had to be replaced with another fix, which also turned into a problem. And the last fix uh, sort of turned out to be a big problem in 2008. Now, now we are in the fourth phase, and I'll say something on that uh, in, in a minute. When, when memory uh, of the abyss was still fresh, demands and blueprints for reform to protect the world from a replay abounded. International conferences and summit meetings of all kinds chased one another, but half a decade later, hardly anything has come out of them. In the meantime, the financial industry, where the disaster originated, has had a full recovery. Profits, dividends, salaries, bonuses are back where they were. While re-regulation got stuck in international negotiations and domestic lobbying. <coughs> Governments, first and foremost that of the United States, have remained firmly in the grip of the money-making industries. These, in turn, are being generously provided with cheap cash created out of thin air on their behalf by their friends in the central banks. I, at this point, I always have to remember everyone that the pres president of the European Central Bank is the former Goldman Sachs chair for Europe, Mario Draghi. Uh, money uh, that they sit on, the banks namely, or invest in government debt. Half a decade after Lehman, growth remains anemic as to labor markets, unprecedented liquidity, fails to jumpstart the economy, and inequality reaches ever more astonishing heights as the little growth that there is is appropriated at the top by the top 1% of income earners and its lion's share by a small fraction of them. These are statistics that I don't have to go into in this, in this audience. Little reason, indeed, to be optimistic. For some time now, OECD capitalism was kept going by liberal injections of fiat money under a policy of monetary expansion of which its architects know better than anyone else that it cannot continue forever. In fact, several attempts were made in 2013 to get off the tiger in Japan as well as in the United States but when stock prices plunged in response, tapering, as it came to be called, was postponed for the time being. In mid-June, uh, the Bank for International Settlements in Basel, uh, which is a very interesting organization, I, I call it the mother of all central banks, de declared quantitative easing to have come to an end. In its annual report, the bank pointed out and I have to quote a little bit in order to show how dramatic this situation is, pointed out that central banks, and, and this, this bank is, is basically a bank owned by the big central bank uh, and some private owners. It's used for uh, international settlements between the central banks. Okay. It's the bank, central bank of central banks. Uh, the bank, in reaction to the crisis and the slow recovery, so, so, that, so it, in its report, it pointed out that, um, um, that national central banks had, in reaction to the crisis, expanded their balance sheets, quote, which are now collectively at roughly three times their pre-crisis level and rising, end quote. While this had been necessary to, as the bank says, prevent financial collapse, now the goal had to be to return still sluggish economies to growth and sustainable growth, quote, end quote. This, however, and now we're at the core of the matter, was beyond the capacities of central banks, which, and now a longer quote, which cannot enact the structural economic and financial reforms needed to return economies to the real growth paths authorities and their publics both want and expect. You have to, you have to uh, sort of <laughs> read this in a deconstructing uh, uh, manner. It's the language of central banks. Uh, 
What central bank accommodation has done during the recovery is to borrow time. My, my book here, <laughs> which came out last week, is called Buying Time, and I was, I was really uh, very pleased that they used the same metaphor, <laughs> to, to borrow time. But time has not been well used, as continued low interest rates and unconventional policies have made it easy for the private sector to postpone deleveraging. You saw my curve. Uh, easy for governments to finance deficits and easy for the authorities to delay needed reforms in the real economy and in the financial system. After all, cheap money makes it easier to borrow than to save, easier to spend than to tax, easier to remain the same than to change. Apparently, end quote, this view was shared even by the Federal Reserve and the Bernanke. By the end of the summer, and they may even have encouraged this, uh, this prose uh, because they are the most important of the shareholders of the, of the bank. Apparently, this you will share. By the end of the summer, it once more seemed to be signaling the Fed that the time of easy money was coming to an end. In September, however, the expected return to higher interest rates was again put off. The reason given was that the economy looked less strong than hoped for. And now, a miracle. Immediately, global stock prices went up. Not down. Uh, the <laughs> economy is weak, means we produce more money, means stock prices go up. That's what they call a bubble. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the real reason, of course, why a return to more conventional monetary policies is so difficult is one that an international institution like BIS is freer to spell out than a still more politically exposed national central bank. This is that as things stand, the only alternative to sustaining capitalism by means of an unlimited money supply is trying to revive it through neoliberal economic reform, as summarily characterized in the second subtitle of the BIS's annual report, which is Enhancing flexibility, the key to growth, exclamation mark. The bitter medicine for the many combined with higher incentives for the few. And this is, <laughs> this is difficult uh, in a democracy to do. So let me say a few words on the present situation uh, in my sort of crisis segment. And then I will uh, uh, briefly summarize part of this essay which will, be, which will appear in the new left review in May uh, on the democratic problem and from there I will go on to the problem of the crisis scenario. Now, right now, we're seeing something very strange, uh, which in a book that is going to come out in a few uh, months, Andrew Gamble, a British political scientist and sociologist, um, uh, the, the book has the title uh, "The End of Western Prosperity" and is very much, very much uh, congenial to what I think is going to happen. Um, he uh, he speaks of a second stagflation. As the uh, what, this time, it is deflation doesn't come from inflation comes from deflation, and stagnation uh, refers to economic growth, not employment, because employment is anyway. Not an issue. Uh, now, in, in, this, uh, in this situation, it's essentially uh, uh, central banks that act as governments of last resort. Uh, fiscal expansion uh, is the recipe, uh, is, is something that is difficult to, to do uh, as long as states are so indebted as they are. The debt overhang is enormous. Uh, as you've seen in the in the in the in the car. So uh, uh, th this doesn't necessarily apply to the United States, as I said yesterday. But the United States has this special capacity uh, that they own the dollar. It applies, however, to everybody else. Uh, so uh, deflation now is the big issue, and uh, the mainstream economists have now discovered the virtues of inflation so that banks are supposed to uh, uh, target inflation, like Larry Summers, we need 2% inflation. 
uh, and, and for this we can have to bring down the interest uh, level to as low as possible. Now, there's the Keynesian problem that there is th this number which is called zero. If, if, the, if the real interest rate is zero, you can't really get it further down. No, says Paul Krugman, you do, you can. And why don't we have negative, in, uh, negative uh, 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 interest rates for a while, even uh, by uh, uh, confiscating all paper money? I mean, how this works is, is a complicated thing, but, but the debate is so desperate, so desperate that, that even such things are being discussed. And, and in this, in, in his uh, response to Larry Summers' uh, uh, important speech at the IMF in, in, in uh, November last year, um, Paul Krugman actually warns against uh, financial reform, because financial reform uh, might discourage what he calls irresponsible borrowing. And we need irresponsible borrowing <laughs> because it's better than no borrowing at all. <laughs> and I take this to be, uh, to be a real uh, indication of how serious the situation is. Yeah. And uh, Larry Summers says, uh, we have secular stagnation. Uh, we, uh, we have to expect <coughs> bubbles all the time. Uh, he, he says, we look back at the at the 2000s and the late 1990s, and essentially, he says, uh, what we believed was economic growth may o only have been uh, uh, bubbles and, and, and a sort of figment of our imagination. This is the, the economic super mind of, of the United States and, of course, the world. So, so that, that's, that's one uh, thing I want to say as a sort of continuation of the sequence of three crises. Now we're in number three and a half or, or four, and it doesn't look much better than, than, than the other ones. As far as democracy is concerned, I will briefly summarize what my, my, my line on this. Uh, yesterday I showed uh, how over uh, these decades of uh, uh, crisis, uh, important indicators of political participation began to decline, like, like voting, uh, trade unionism, strikes, and, and so on. What I didn't mention uh, clearly enough was that we have found in our work at the Institute that disproportionately the resignation about uh, politics takes place at the lower end of the income of this People at the bottom drop out of, uh, of politics. They have given up all hope that, that this will help them. This, however, does not say that at the top people are satisfied with democracy. They have different reasons. For them, uh, the rhetoric, the, uh, the rhetoric of sort of anti-democracy, is very strong now in elite circles. Uh, it is about uh, uh, the, the necessary reforms cannot be made in a democracy. Democracies decide too slowly. Uh, there's too much noise in a democracy. Uh, what we need is more competent government. And that, of course, is the government of the central banks. No institution is so remote from political pressure as a central bank, especially in Europe, where you now have a central bank for 13 or so countries, uh, which has no counterpart in the political system. It has 13 governments, but these governments have given up their monetary, their, their, their monetary authority. So uh, uh, much of this rhetoric begins to resemble. It's, it's, a, it's a, this pro-China rhetoric, which, which attributes to the Chinese state a capacity to control its economy and its population that may or may not exist, but that is seen as highly desirable uh, in a global uh, world economy where, people, where, where this apparently uh, is needed, uh, or where people believe it is needed, or where, where they would like to have that. Um, Doubts, and, and, and then of course Europe you see uh, how institutional reforms remove economic decision making uh, gradually from uh, the impact of parliaments, uh, um, uh, the industrial relations systems through these uh, wonderful uh, supranational institutions that are inaccessible for democratic influence. Doubts still, doubts continue among the profit-dependent classes, as I call them, as to whether democracy will, even in its emasculated post-democratic version, 
allow for the neoliberal structural reforms necessary for their regime to recover. Uh, like ordinary citizens, although for opposite reasons, elites are losing faith in democratic government and its suitability for rebuilding societies in line with market pressures for unimpeded technocratic decision making and unlimited adaptability of social structures and ways of life. Public choice's disparaging view of democratic politics as corruption of market justice in the service of opportunistic politicians and their clientele has become common sense among the public elites, as has the belief that market capitalism, cleansed of democratic politics, will not only be more efficient, but also more virtuous and responsible. Countries like China are complemented as models. In, in Europe, uh, we are now talking about uh, market-conforming democracy, which is a term invented by uh, the Chancellor of the Federal Republic from Merkel. Yeah? We need a market-conforming democracy. Mm -hmm. And, <laughs> and uh, you, you can imagine, if, if, you if you have understood that democracy very often is actually uh, uh, something that uh, is needed to correct markets uh, and to correct the imbalances that exist in markets, then this, this would mean a 180% 180 degree change. So having said that, I come to, uh, to the crisis. Uh, that is how we, how we shall understand this crisis. Capitalism on the brink. Has capitalism seen its day? In the 1980s, the idea was abandoned that modern capitalism, quote unquote, could be run as a mixed economy. Andrew Schoenfeld, uh, both technocratically managed and democratically controlled. Later, in the neoliberal revolution, social and economic order was reconceived as a benevolently emerging, as benevolently emerging from a free play of market forces. But in the crash of 2008, the promise of self-regulating markets attaining equilibrium on their own was discredited as well, without a plausible new formula for political economic governance inside, apart from uh, the, the money making by central banks, which the central banks themselves believe that this cannot be done forever. This alone may be regarded as a symptom of a crisis that has become systemic the more so, the longer it lasts. It is my view that it is high time, in the light of decades of declining growth, growing inequality, and increasing indebtedness, as well as of the successive crises of inflation, public debt, and financial implosion, it is high time to think about capitalism as a historical phenomenon, or to do this again, one that has not just a beginning, but also an end. For this, we need to part company with misleading models of institutional institution of a social and institutional change. As long as we imagine the end of capitalism being decreed Leninist style by some government or central committee, we cannot but consider capitalism eternal. In fact, it was communism, centralized as it was in Moscow, that could be and was terminated by decree. This, however, is different if we allow for capitalism to collapse by itself, instead of being replaced by collective decision with some providentially designed new order. I suggest that we learn to think about capitalism coming to an end without assuming responsibility for answering a question like, what do you propose to put in its place? It is a Marxist or better modernist prejudice that capitalism as a historical epoch will end only when a new, better society is inside and a revolutionary subject is ready to implement it for the progress of mankind. This presupposes an amount of political control over our collective fate of which we cannot even dream after the historical destruction of collective agency and indeed of the hope for it in the neoliberal globalist revolution. I'll say something on this later. Neither 
uh, utopian vision of an alternative future, Eric, <laughs> or superhuman foresight should be required to validate the claim that capitalism is facing its better demand. I'm willing to make exactly that claim, although I'm aware of how often capitalism has already been declared dead in the past. In fact, all of the main theorists of uh, capitalism have predicted its I impending expiry ever since the concept came into use in the mid-1800s. This includes not just radical critics like Marx or Polanyi, but also bourgeois theorists such as Weber, Schumpeter, Zombard, and Keynes. So if history proves me wrong, I will be in very good company. <laughs> that, that something has failed to happen in spite of reasonable predictions that it would does not mean that it will never happen. Here too there is no inductive proof. I believe that this time is different from the title of a famous book. Uh, one symptom being that even capitalism's master technicians have no clue today how to make the system whole again. See the recently published minutes of the deliberations of the governing bodies of the Federal Reserve in 2008, uh, on which Gretchen Morgenson in the New York Times, uh, who has inspected these things, uh, writes an article with the title, A New Light on Regulators in the Dark. Uh, and she says the, the, the minutes present, quote, a disturbing picture of a central bank that was in the dark about each looming disaster throughout 2008. That gives you real confidence that they can manage this. Uh, or, as I said, the desperate search of central bankers mentioned above for the right moment to end quantitative easing. This, however, is only the surface. Beneath it is the stark fact that capitalist progress has by now as much, uh, as, much as destroyed any agency that could facilitate that progress by limiting it. The point being that the stability of capitalism as a socioeconomic system depends on its proper dynamic, its eigendynamic being contained by countervailing forces, by collective interests and institutions subjecting capital accumulation to social checks and balances. The implication is that capitalism may undermine itself by being too successful. I will argue this point in more detail below. The image I have of the end of capitalism, an end that I believe is already underway, I propose, is one of a social system in chronic disrepair for reasons of its own and even in the absence of a viable alternative. While we cannot know when and how exactly capitalism will disappear and what will succeed it, what matters is that no force is in sight that could be expected to reverse the three downward trends in economic growth, social equality, and financial stability, and end their mutual reinforcement. Until in the 19, unlike in the 1930s, there's today no new political economic formula on the horizon, left or right, that might restore to capitalist societies a coherent regime of regulation or in the French uh, uh, school, regulation. Social integration as well as system integration in the terms of, uh, of Lockwood seem irreversibly damaged and set to deteriorate further. What is most likely to happen as time passes is a continuous accumulation of small and not so small dysfunctions, none deadly as such, but most beyond repair, certainly as they become too many for individual address. In the process, the parts of the whole will fit less and less, frictions of all kinds will multiply, unanticipated consequences will spread along ever more obscure lines of causation, uncertainty will proliferate, crises of all sorts, of legitimacy, productivity, or both, will follow each other in short succession, while predictability and governability will further decline, as they have for decades now, until the myriad of provisional fixes invented on the go for short-term crisis management will collapse under the weight of a chaotic succession of daily disasters produced by a social order in disarray. And basically this is nothing other than uh, 
what Larry Summers predicts for the future. Con conceiving of the end of capitalism as a process rather than an event raises the issue of how to define capitalism. Societies are complex entities that do not die in the way organisms do. With rare exceptions of total extinction, discontinuity is always embedded in some continuity. If we say that the society has ended, we mean that certain features of its organization that we consider essential to it have disappeared. Others may well have survived. I propose that to, deter that to determine if capitalism is alive, dying, or dead, we define it as a modern society, or as Adam Smith has it, a progressive society, one dedicated to boundless growth, that's the progression of its productivity and prosperity, as measured by the size of its money economy. In other words, again, define it as a modern society that secures its collective reproduction as an unintended side effect of individually rational competitive profit maximization in pursuit of capital accumulation through a labor process combining privately owned capital with commodified labor. In other words, a society that fulfills the Mandevillian promise of private vices turning into public benefit. Uh, it is this promise, I maintain, that contemporary capitalism can no longer keep, ending its historic existence as a self-reproducing, sustainable, predictable, and legitimate social order. So that's the core of my, of my uh, point. The demise of capitalism so defined is unlikely to follow anybody's blueprint. As the decay progresses, it is bound to provoke political protests and many forward attempts at collective intervention. But for a long time, if not forever, it is likely that these will remain of the Luddite sort, local, dispersed, uncoordinated, sometimes destructive, primitive in the sense of Hobsbawm's primitive rebels, and irresponsive in the sense of unable not having the tools to be responsive. Uh, adding to the disorder while unable to create a new order. At best, unintentionally helping that new order to come about without knowing what it will be like. One should think that a long-lasting crisis may open up more than a few windows of opportunity for reformist or revolutionary agency. It seems, however, that disorganized capitalism is disorganizing its opposition as well as itself, depriving it of the capacity not just to defeat, but also to rescue it. For capitalism to end then, it must destroy itself, and this itself, and this I maintain, is exactly what we are today witnessing. Um, okay, I have a few more minutes, and I will use this uh, to elaborate on these strong claims. Why should capitalism, whatever its deficiencies, be in crisis at all if it has no opposition anymore that deserves its name? The capitalism has become the only game in town and, which, uh, there, and to which there really is, quote, no alternative. When communism imploded in, the, in 1989, this was widely viewed as capitalism, capitalism's final victory, the end of history. Even today, after 2008, the old left remains on the brink of extinction everywhere, while a new, new left has up to now failed to appear, except in Madison. <laughs> the, the masses, the poor and powerless, as well as the relatively well-to-do, seem firmly in the grip of consumerism, with collective goods, collective action, and collective organization thoroughly out of fashion. No opposition in sight, why should capitalism not carry on? By default, if by nothing else. Indeed, at first glance, there is much that speaks against pronouncing capitalism dead. I don't, I don't want to list, list this here and go to my answer, is that having no opposition may actually be more of a liability for capitalism than an asset. And here comes my Polanyan, uh, my Polanyan uh, point. Social systems thrive on internal heterogeneity, 
on a pluralism of organizing principles, pr protecting them from dedicating themselves entirely to a single purpose, crowding out all other purposes that must also be attended to if the system is to be sustainable. Capitalism as we know it has greatly benefited from the rise of counter-movements against the rule of profit and of the market. That's Polanyi's point. Socialism and trade unionism, by putting a break on commodification, prevented capitalism from destroying its non-capitalist foundations, like trust, loyalty, good faith, altruism, thrift, solidarity with fam within families and communities, and the like. Also, under Keynesianism and Fordism, capitalism's most, more or less loyal opposition union, secured and helped stabilize aggregate demand, especially in recessions, where circumstances were favorable, working class organization even served as a productivity whip by forcing capital to embark on more advanced production concepts. Joel Rogers and I have, have written about this. It is in this sense that Jeffrey Hodgson, institutional economist has argued that capitalism can survive only as long as it is not, not completely capitalist, as it has not yet rid itself of the society in which it resides of what Hodgson calls necessary impurities, or uh, in a less functionalist language I use the concept of beneficial constraint. See, in this way, capitalism's defeat of its opposition may actually have been a pyrrhic victory freeing it from countervailing powers, which, while sometimes uncomfortable, had in fact supported it. Could it be that victorious capitalism has become its own worst enemy? In exploring this possibility, one may resort to Karl Polanyi's idea of social limits to market expansion, as underlying his concept of the three fictitious commodities, land, labor, uh, and money. The fictitious commodity is defined as a resource to which the laws of supply and demand apply only partly and awkwardly, if at all. It can therefore only in carefully circumscribed, regulated way be treated as a commodity, since complete commodification will destroy it or make it unusable. Markets, however, have an inherent tendency to expand beyond the original field by trading the original field, the trading of material goods, to all other spheres of life, regardless of their suitability for commodification, or in Marxian terms, for subsumption under the logic of capital accumulation. Uh, and, and, the, and the irony is that the enemies of capitalism prevented from, from this uh, condition and thereby sustained. Okay. Unless held back by constraining institutions, market expansion is thus at permanent risk of undermining itself, and with it the viability of the capitalist economic and social system. In fact, indications are that market expansion has today reached a critical threshold with respect to all three of Polanyi's fictitious commodities, as institutional safeguards that serve to protect them from full marketization have eroded on a broad front. This is what seems to be behind the search currently underway in all advanced capitalist societies for a new time regime with respect to labor. In particular, a new allocation of time between social and economic relations and pursuits. Secondly, for a sustainable energy re regime in relation to nature. And thirdly, for a stable financial regime for the production and allocation of money. In all three areas, societies are today groping for new and more effective limitations on the logic of capitalist expansion. Uh, you could even say, the, the German word Steigerungslogik, the logic of ever more, is difficult to translate into English. But th that's what we're talking about. Uh, institutionalized, this lo logic of expansion, institutionalized as one of private enrichment that is fundamental to the capitalist social order as defined. Limitations on the increasingly demanding claims made by the and, and this is what, what, what we're looking for, limitations on the increasingly demanding claims made by the employment system on human labor, the capitalist production and consumption systems on finite natural resources, and the financial and banking <coughs> system on people's confidence in ever more complex pyramids of money, credit, and debt. 
looking at the three Bolanian crisis zones one by one, we may know that it was an excessive commodification of money that brought down the global economy in 2008, the transformation of a, limited, of a limitless supply of cheap credit into ever more sophisticated financial products that gave rise to a real estate bubble of, at the time, unimaginable size. Beginning in the 1980s, deregulation of financial markets had removed the restrictions on the private production and marketization of money devised after the Great Depression. Financialization, as the process came to be called, seemed the last remaining way to restore growth and profitability to the economy of the overextended hegemon of global capitalism in the United States. Once let loose, however, the money-making industry invested a good part of its enormous resources in lobbying for a further removal of prudential regulation, not to mention in circumventing whatever rules were left. With hindsight, the enormous risks that came from the move, that came with the move from the old regime of MCM star for the Marxists to a new one of MM star. Uh, these risks are easy to see, and so is the trend toward ever increasing inequality associated with the disproportionate growth of the banking system. Concerning nature, there is growing unease over a now widely perceived tension between the capitalist principle of infinite expansion and the finite, su the finite, finite supply of natural resources. Neo-Malthusian discourses of various de denominations became popular in the 1970s. Whatever one may think of them, and of the fact that some are now considered prematurely alarmist, nobody seriously denies that the energy consumption patterns of rich capitalist societies cannot be extended to the rest of the world without destroying essential preconditions of human life. What seems to be shaping up is a race between the advancing exhaustion of nature on the one hand and technological innovation on the other, substituting artificial materials for natural ones, preventing or repairing environmental damage, and devising shelters against unavoidable environmental degradation. One question that nobody seems able to answer, however, is how the enormous collective resources potentially required for this may be mobilized in societies governed by possessive individualism, as Macpherson called, called this. And, and I must say that yes, when, when, when I talked yesterday on, on public finances, this is one of the big issues uh, of this conflict between uh, a society that needs to extract collective resources by taxation in a global uh, economy and the growing needs for collective goods uh, uh, produced by the progress of the capitalist production system. Yeah. Uh, um, and nobody knows what actors and institutions are to secure the collective good of a livable environment in a world of competitive production and consumption. Thirdly, the commodification of human labor may have reached a critical point as well. Deregulation of labor markets under international competition has undone whatever prospects there might have been in the 1970s for a general limitation of working hours. Consider the attack on the last remnant of the 35-hour week in France, now under the auspices of a socialist president and his party. And I'm old enough to remember how in the 1970s there was a serious discussion, not just, uh, not just uh, <laughs> um, uh, empty thought about using the progress in productivity for extending the free time from work. It's totally wrong. It's totally wrong. Um, uh, the commodification has also made employment more precarious for a growing share of the population. Um, the, here's a, a, another, another sort of footnote on the, on the uh, working time thing. From the capitalist frontier, as I said, it is reported that leading investment banks have begun suggesting to their lowest level employees that they, quote, should try to spend four weekend days away from the office each month. Four weekend days. Part of a broader effort to improve working conditions. And this is New York Times under the heading of Wall Street shock. Uh, take a day off, even a Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> we, we know uh, this 
way of life. Uh, with a growing, with the rising labor market participation of women, due in part to disappearance of the family wage, hours per month sold by families to employers have increased, while wages have lagged behind productivity, most dramatically in the capitalist heartland, the United States. At the same time, deregulation and the destruction of trade unions notwithstanding, labor markets typically fail to clear. And residual unemployment on the order of 7 to 8 percent has become, as I showed yesterday, the new normal, even in a country like Sweden. Sweatshops have expanded in many industries, including services, but mostly on the global periphery, beyond the reach of authorities and what remains of trade unions in the capitalist center and out of view of consumers. As sweated labor competes for employment with workers in countries with historically long, strong labor protection, working conditions there must deteriorate while unemployment turns in daily. And that's what we observe, not just here. Meanwhile, complaints proliferate about the penetration of work into family life, alongside pressures from labor markets to join an unending race for upgrading one's human capital, that's the core here. Moreover, global mobility enables employers to replace unwilling local workers with willing immigrant ones. It also compensates for sub-replacement fertility due in part to a changed balance between unpaid and paid work and between non-market and market consumption. The result is a secular weakening of social counter-movements caused by a loss of class and social solidarity and accompanied by crippling political conflicts over ethnic diversity, even in traditionally liberal countries like the Netherlands, Sweden, and Norway. Those who don't know the Netherlands today, they can't imagine how this country has changed in, in, in a matter of two decades. Uh, and Sweden now, Sweden is coming along. The question, how and where capital accumulation must be restrained in order to protect the three fictitious commodities from total commodification has been contested throughout the history of capitalism. But the present worldwide disorder in all three border zones at the same time is something different. It results from a spectacularly successful onslaught of faster than ever expanding markets on a wide range of institutions and actors inherited from the past or built up in long political struggles that had for a time kept capitalist progress more or less socially embedded. Labor, land, and money have simultaneously become crisis zones due to globalization, quote unquote, endowing market relations and production chains with an unprecedented capacity to cross the borders of national, legal, and political jurisdictions. The result is a fundamental disorganization of agencies that have in the modern era more or less successfully domesticated the capitalist animal spirits for the sake of society as a whole as well as of capitalism itself. And uh, if, if you survey the literature on international attempts to organize constraints on markets and, and on all these books, you, you, you see that there's lots of uh, attempts, but, but it, never, it never gets very far. Um, Incidentally, it is not only with respect to fictitious commodities that capital accumulation may be hitting its limits. On the surface, consumption of goods and services continues to grow, and the implicit premise of modern economics that the human desire and capacity to consume is unlimited would seem easily vindicated by a visit to any large shopping mall. Still, fears that markets for consumer goods may at some point become saturated, perhaps in the course of a post-materialist decoupling of human aspirations for happiness from the acquisition of purchasable commodities. These fears are endemic among profit-dependent producers, reflecting the fact that consumption in mature capitalist societies has long become dissociated from material needs. Think of the gigantic potlatch, I say here, organized every year before Christmas by the consumer goods and retail industries. Or, or to me, very interesting, the day after Thanksgiving, 
ominously referred to in the United States as Black Friday <laughs> because of the ubiquitous price reductions and the collective shopping hysteria it inaugurated. And, and this needs to be organized. This doesn't come naturally to you. Yeah. Um, the lion's share of consumption expenditure today and the rapidly growing share is spent not on the use value of goods, but on their symbolic value, their aura or halo, and the dreams, quote unquote, that come with them. This is why industry practitioners find themselves paying more than ever for marketing, including not just advertisement, but also product design and innovation. Nevertheless, in spite of the growing sophistication of sales promotion, the intangibles of culture make commercial success ever more difficult to predict. Uh, and I, I give you an example. The panic among automobile producers, I think two years ago, when marketing research claimed to have discovered that young people had become more enamored with the latest microelectronic gadgets than with a new car and expected to derive more social recognition from, from these small things. They were absolutely in panic. And, and I've studied the auto industry and, and I, uh, I, I, I could observe it. So, uh, very difficult to me. Certainly more so than in an era when growth could be achieved by gradually supplying all households in a country with a washing machine. Now all of these things, and I come to a con conclusion here, I look at these three crisis zones and I add the, the uh, consumption uh, problem to, to them. Uh, the interesting thing is that the fact that there's no sort of either traditional or modern restraint on the expansion of markets in this area uh, can be shown to be a serious hazard for the reproduction of the system. It hits limits. Uh, and it hits these limits because nobody is there to prevent them from doing so. And I, I would think that this uh, brings the Bolanian dialectic of movement and counter-movement into a uh, credible uh, discussion uh, or new formulation of crisis theory, especially if we uh, if we include uh, the uh, condition that I uh, pointed out, that in order to speak of a capitalist crisis, we need not uh, to be able to point to a powerful opponent who is about to topple the system, but we can assume that there can also be the possibility that the social system can undermine itself as a result of its own, uh, of its own dynamic. Uh, and then one can think about crisis scenarios and the possibilities for uh, human, uh, more constructive intervention in them. Although, to, to conclude, when I so began to think about this, I was all the time drawn to a historical model that uh, one cannot really recommend uh, to be replicated, with this, which is the end of the Western Roman Empire in the, in the fourth century. It took centuries of, of barbarism uh, until something like a new order emerged from the slow disintegration of this, uh, of this civilization. Uh, there was no opposition, it was just unsustainable. And uh, uh, we should, maybe, maybe someone knows uh, how to escape a replication of this process. Thank you. Eric, come on. I'll uh, call on people as they... And this is the final sheet going around. Keep that moving. We can bring it around where it is now. But. Uh, so I'm trying to sort out the parts of your talk that are... Or your, your explanation that are structural and then in yeah. contingent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. On, on the bottom sort of half of the talk and on the other half. So I... So, uh, on the crisis part, you talk about three trends, financial instability, increasing inequality, and increasing growth. I want to know the degree to which, I, I actually, I didn't really hear a theory, a crisis theory that's linking those things together. Um, so, so I can't tell whether you are linking them in a somewhat contingent way, or if you really do have a kind of structural theory. 
obviously you're making a big claim about the future, so that's a reason you'd want to have a structural kind of argument, a theoretical argument, rather than just ta just talking about the trends. And then on the other side, on the lack of an opposition pushing for public goods, which can stabilize or mitigate against uh, the crisis, I also couldn't tell. You, you have a you have a number of anecdotes about the weakness of social movements in different places, uh, but I couldn't tell the degree to which those are contingent or if there's a real structural theory which which explains them. The fact that they're that it's everywhere suggests uh, some kind of structural theory, but I don't. I didn't hear one from your talk. Okay. Um, the, the the second question is easier to, to answer. For me. Uh, there the. Uh, the theory, if you want, is that uh, uh, markets, especially if they are uh, organized in the, under a global uh, uh, monetary system, are more uh, universalistic, universal than human beings. So to speak. Human beings are sort of local, and the expansion of markets beyond local uh, uh, jurisdictions creates an enormous organizational problem for uh, counter-movement. Uh, because the formulation of a universal interest uh, becomes much more difficult than the formulation of a particularistic <coughs> interest inside the larger system. So I would, uh, th this would be my sort of general uh, conceptual framework for understanding why it is so diff people are People always come as, as special people who live in a special historical situation, they speak a different language, they develop a different identity, and to, uh, to organize them into one common uh, interest is very, very difficult. Uh, so that's not contingent, that's structural. Uh, and as far as, uh, as the uh, post-war three uh, trends go, uh, I'm, I'm not so, but what, what fascinates me about them is their mutual interlinkage, so to speak. Um, growth, if inequality increases, uh, almost certainly uh, this has a negative impact on growth. If growth declines, however, inequality tends to increase because it uh, exacerbates the uh, distribution of conflict. Um, the, the same with that. So, so you can you can look at these three things and see how they are uh, sort of wired into one another. I don't want to go much further. Uh, uh, there are uh, theories of uh, of capitalist, uh, uh, let's say, decline structuralist theories. The non-Marxist example is is uh, Robert Gordon. Is it Robert? Yeah, I, I, I think I think this this guy. Gordon, who, who looks at the relationship between capitalist economic growth and technological uh, uh, problems. That would be a structuralist theory. I, I would want to build this into it, but more uh, by way of a contingent factor that has an effect on the uh, capability of this of a system to operate in a more equitable way. Because obviously, productivity increases, uh, increase the, uh, the capacity of elites to share with uh, their masses. I wouldn't go, wouldn't want to go any further. Next question. Yeah. Can you talk some about the, uh, the role of China and Brazil and other developing countries that there's a kind of counter yeah. story to this internal not, uh, not really. collapse? Yeah, yeah, not really. So it's, that's a good, I, I have to get up here. No, that's a good point. If you, if you follow the, the BRIC uh, uh, narrative after the crisis of 2008, suddenly there were the BRICs. And the BRICs were the hope of the future. If you now follow, now the BRICs have been replaced by the Fragile Five. That's the new, that's the new term. And in part, because they suffer from the very quantitative easing uh, uh, policies uh, of the center, uh, in order to uh, to save themselves from their own uh, problem, uh, you also now learn suddenly learn something about how fragile Russia is as a, as a political economy. You learn something 
uh, Russia for a while was the wonderful alternative. Capitalism uh, was was flowering. Uh, now you learn something about China, namely, interestingly, that Chinese <coughs> banks seem to be up to their ears in debt, and especially local local communities. There seems to, there seems to be public debt and uh, and and the uh, financial underregulation problem in China of huge dimension. At least this is what is now what what we're now. Here. Brazil, one heard when he's about the typical patterns of corruption that, that go with, uh, uh, that, that exist on the periphery. Well, what I want to say is that, uh, uh, in my view, uh, one, could, one could figure these, they, there's no way of uh, building up the bricks, or however they are called, as the rising alternative to the center. What I would rather see is the inter interdependence between them. And then, uh, and then comes a notion which I, uh, uh, which very much feeds into my, uh, into my crisis scenario, uh, which is the question of the capitalist hegemon of the capitalist world system. Now, this this system requires some sort of central uh, government, uh, a, cent uh, a common banker, uh, someone who uh, serves as banker of last resort, and. In the 19th century, uh, this was the British Empire. The Bank, the bank of England was basically the, the, the bank of the world. Uh, in the night, after the First World War, the British were no longer able to play this role, and the Americans were, no longer, uh, were not yet willing to do it. And you had a period of complete uh, international anarchy, which resulted, among other things, in all the things that we remember from the first half of the 20th century. Then after the end of the, uh, of, of the Second World War, the Americans moved into the role of the global hegemon. And that lasted very much until the, uh, the mid-1970s. Now, uh, it is not clear who is the hegemon. And even worse, for the future, in order to stabilize this on a global system, one would have to have some sort of shared hegemonic role, China, uh, the United States, and so on. And I would think that for domestic policy reasons in the United States, it's very, very hard to think of the US being able to agree to, let's say, an artificial global currency in the form of special drawing rights administered by an international organization to which the United States would have to submit. So, so uh, yes, uh, the rise of other countries could actually be in very, very much a destabilizing factor. Certainly destabilizing the center in the sense that as the growth rates have slowed here, yeah. the growth rates have grown there, and one assumes there's some relationship. Yeah, I want to. But however, uh, I, I want to see them for a somewhat longer time. Mm -hmm. yeah, people, people sort of uh, run off on a tangent very often. You, you have uh, a growth rate in Brazil for five years to the tune of 8%, and then suddenly Brazil is the rising star. Next year, there could be, there could be a, a bubble, and, and, and things could completely change. So it seems to me that you're a little premature calling for the end just because it doesn't seem like really a, a, a strong version of a left political program has really been tried anywhere. And just to, just to not even get left, but just specific, why would you suggest that we're at the end? For, for example, why is Greece locked into the, to the euro, right? I mean, why wouldn't you see things like, you know, this seems pretty straightforward, right? Countries getting out of the euro to see if there's a way out. I mean, the, the range of, are you suggesting that these kind of alternatives are off the table? And if they're off the table, are they off the table because of, of disorganization of the, in, the impossibility of organizing opposition to them? Jody, the, uh, the, the, the question has two, uh, at least two facets, I think. One is, uh, is it possible for individual countries uh, to, to find a sort of niche uh, in, in the system in which they can prosper, for example, could Greece get out of the euro, and then it would be better. That, that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is, uh, is it possible to construct a, uh, a general regime under which everybody can, can, can form? Uh, now, now, the first thing, uh, one usually, the one thing that, that I think is that one usually underestimates the, the dilemmatic character of really important decisions. So nobody knows whether if, if the Greeks actually get, get out of, uh, of the euro, it will actually be better for them uh, afterwards. Uh, so uh, 
basically many things are also irreversible. But once they once they happen, it's very difficult to undo them. Uh, afterwards, you wouldn't do them again, but you have done them, uh, and now you're into it. Uh, in Europe, it would have been possible, in my view, and now there are many people who would would would, would think that this is quite a reasonable idea. It would have been much more reasonable in the 1990s to construct a better uh, sort of regulated uh, regime of partly flexible uh, exchange rates between these countries in the European internal market. A little bit along the model that John Maynard Keynes proposed for the world economy in 1944. But for a number of reasons, uh, the, the, the governments at this time were unable to see this as a, as a productive alternative. Uh, because all sorts of, uh, of things came in, the German unification, the desire of the French to, uh, to sort of uh, end German uh, uh, monetary hegemony by uh, uh, taking, uh, by bundling or pooling uh, monetary sovereignty in a common regime, and then so on and so on. Uh, I, I would say that people make a lot of mistakes, uh, and afterwards they recognize them, but, but not before. However, then, then the more general thing is, uh, is it possible to think of deliberate, uh, let's say deliberative democracy at a global level among these many actors and many interests where the markets are already very much integrated? Take, it, take one, as one example, um, the modern infrastructure of communication in the world is Facebook or Google. These are private firms based in America, but essentially they serve infrastructural mm -hmm. uh, functions for the entire, uh, for, for everybody in the world. Can you imagine that you could bring them under some kind of collective governance as they should be, uh, because they now belong uh, to the everyday life of everyone? No. Uh, it's, it's inconceivable that this can happen. And then the, yeah. So when you talked about the you know progressing absorption of speak up a little bit. When, when you're talking about the inevitable like current absorption of um, counter moving institutions, yeah. I mean institutions. I, I just want to ask you. I mean, it, it seems a bit confusing to me because it seems, to, especially because of like changes in technology. For example, Facebook, as you mentioned just now. The capacity for organizational alternatives and ways for civil society or humans in general to organize many new historically unprecedented ways and do therefore form completely new forms of counter moving institutions is bigger than it has ever been before. So I just wanted to critically. So the collective action model that you were implicitly yeah, yeah, using yeah. was that the universalism is impossible to construct yeah. because of the particularization of people's lives in yeah. these kind of ways. But these kinds of big networks are universalizing as well yeah. in terms of people's identities. Yeah. I mean, when I was, I was just in Taipei talking to students inside the state legislature, and they sounded like they were from Wisconsin. You know, the, there was absolutely yeah. no difficulty in having a, a serious, intense discussion with them about the nature of protests and the yeah. search for democracy. Yeah. They shared the same concerns. And, you know, of course there's particularities, but the particularities did not define their sense of identity or interest. And in the way that's suggested by that gloomy look of, Complete fragmentation. So Not complete, no, uh, no. But but let me maybe to make the point uh, less uh, uh, a little stronger, which is that it moves more slowly than uh, the market, and uh, the language of money is more universal than the language of the social protest. Uh, although you can sort of work towards this. <coughs> But time is of the essence, I think. Uh, Europe is a very good example in, in, in this respect. It is not completely impossible that you could, at some stage, uh, have a European citizenry uh, which uh, 
which is multinational and organizes itself along its class lines or progressive versus not progressive and, and, and so on. But when will this happen? Maybe in 20, 30, 40 years. In the meantime, other things happen. Uh, like the, uh, so the, the, uh, the construction of a completely technocratic, uh, politically, uh, politically uh, uh, sterilized uh, system of economic governance, as we see now. Uh, these people can move much faster. Uh, and, and humans are impeded by their particularity. The, the thing is even worse, be, because uh, uh, while your uh, interlocutors in, in uh, Taipei uh, are, as you say, they, they, they could be students here, it is also an objective, I think, of a livable human uh, society that you have diversity. And that you that you communicate across uh, uh, distinctions uh, that are not just uh, accidental, but that allow for different forms of life. And uh, and the, 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 the problem of of uh, expanding capitalism is that it uh, imposes a regime of rational individualism on many societies, on all societies that come under its control. Uh, the, in Europe, for example, we now see that the hard currency regime that, uh, that Europe imposes on the Mediterranean countries is in many ways incompatible with uh, uh, economic traditions, <coughs> economic institutions in these countries. It forces them uh, to, quote unquote, reform in the in the sense of the of the Basel uh, bank uh, report that, that, that I quoted, so there's a unifying pressure, and it is worth often worthwhile to resist that unifying pressure together with others who also don't want to be unified, and that's a difficult organizational problem. Uh, gay and then yeah. So I'm a little curious about why we call it post-capitalism because really. It looks to me like if you're on the upper end of the income spectrum, it's not a crisis at all. Mm -hmm. So it looks to me like a crisis of capitalism and democracy, which is a very different thing. Mm -hmm. And the way I would think about resolving that crisis would be really different than resolving the crisis of capitalism. So instead of thinking about the collapse of the Roman Empire and 400 years of barbarism, mm -hmm. I sort of want to think about maybe the 15 years between 1930 and 1945, when, as Stephen Krasner says, the Bretton Woods institutions were designed to deal with the crisis of the Depression. And one could say that we've now outlived the Bretton Woods institutions. Maybe the crisis that we're really describing is what happened when we went off the gold standard and the deregulation that followed after that. And we have yet to create the institutions <coughs> to control capitalism yeah. that we need. But that's not the end of capitalism. It's the end of this kind of capitalism. And I think there's going to be an upsurge of democracy that's going to require the new social political controls. But first, we need analyses that say who's driving this kind of inequity, and that's missing from your analysis. What are the mechanisms and the political actors that are creating this kind of dynamic, which I would call, or one might call, neoliberalism? The but where are the multinational corporates? Capitalists. OK. <laughs> but, but, but they were from this story, you never mentioned multinational corporate capitalism and their role on changing trade yeah. rules. And, and the way the World Bank and the IMF moved to conditionality and what that meant for economic policy. Without oh. that analysis, you can't think about what policies might regulate. Yeah, I, I, I have the very weak defense that you can't say everything uh, at, 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 at once. But more, uh, more importantly, if I, if I listen carefully to what you say, um, then there's two different uh, modes of speaking. One is sort of descriptive, very good. The other is, therefore, we must have a new system. That's not descriptive. That is sort of pro that is that is problematic. Now, what I'm trying to say is that under present conditions, I find it very difficult to see who would be, who the agent would be, who would carry out that obligation that you uh, outline in a sentence where the word must shows up. Yeah. We, we can talk about, we must have a, I, I fully agree that this sort of 1970s to now segment can be written in terms of the uh, uh, global economy 
uh, being entirely dissolved of gold or, or separated from gold. And then you have a, uh, and then you need, the more you sort of uh, take leave of the idea of a natural value, natural order like gold, you need a governance regime that replaces it. Yeah. Well, I think gold was a governance regime. I don't think there was a yeah, natural. Yeah, that is also in, true. That is also true. But 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 there is the assumption that there is some sort of thing there. Now we need some governance regime. And since the 1973 or when, whenever it was end of the of the Bretton Woods regime, we've been groping for one, but we didn't we didn't find one. Uh, and you can explain why. Uh, now, my challenge, I mentioned that, is to specify uh, not so much the sort of regime that we will need. I, I think that can be done. But to specify the forces, the political actors that can actually implement it. And there, I think, my disorganization uh, claim uh, applies. Yeah. Um, my question is related to both the first and the last question, actually. Um, so there are two tendencies in your Bergson um, advanced capitalist political economies, which I believe are somewhat in tension with, with each other. The first tendency is to um, emphasize the importance of the institutional framework within which capitalist relations are embedded, and also the importance of the political, historical, contingent, and there, therefore variegated nature of that institutional framework. And there is another tendency to um, stress the commonalities mm -hmm. of capitalism across uh, nation states, the commonalities um, and certain structural tendencies that cross-cut national capitalism. So my question is, as a student of political economies, how we can combine these two things together conceptually in a coherent fashion? I mean. Uh, both talk about larger social structures as you do, but also not lose the specifics and politics and contingents. You can combine it by making them contingent. Uh, there are uh, conditions under which uh, institutional diversity can thrive. And if these conditions disappear, the pressure for conversions gets stronger. Uh, so it, it's not a sort of ontological uh, claim. Uh, it has to be historically uh, conditioned. Um, it, it, as a simple model, the, since, since we mentioned the, the, the Bretton Woods system, the Bretton Woods system was in part result of the wisdom of someone like John Maynard Keynes and others at, at, at the time, that you could not uh, impose the same uh, economic regime and the same domestic economic institutions and politics on countries as diverse as Britain and Italy and France and so on. So you have to have a safety uh, device uh, like devaluation or credit from the International Monetary Fund in order to allow for diversity. So diversity then gets institutionalized. Uh, however, as these institutions disappear, uh, other forces, forces pressing for uh, convergence, uh, may prevail. Yeah. So it's not an ontological claim. Uh, the, 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 and, and then, in addition, uh, since we're talking about the family of, uh, of systems, all capitalists, we can immediately assume that they will have both commonalities and differences. No family member is exactly like the other family members, and uh, however, they are from the same family. And then it's a very good question uh, to see how much individuality that family allows, also over time. Yeah. And, and there I'm, I'm with the sort of traditional uh, Marxist, also the Bavarian uh, uh, tradition, that capitalist uh, uh, capital accumulation and, and the subsumption of, the, of life spheres under the, the accumulation principle are or rationalization uh, labor, are very powerful forces. And if you want to, uh, to modify them or to, uh, uh, to keep them in check, uh, you need institutions to do that. 
So again, my, uh, I don't see a difference, I don't see incompatibility between an institutionalist and a sort of structuralist. No, I didn't mean um, tension in a negative sense, I just want to ask how we can do it in a coherent way, conceptually. Yeah, yeah, I, and, and, I, and I try to answer that question mm -hmm. by making this relationship continue. Well, it's, <clears throat> it's not, well, one more question. Then. Well, I would kind of argue that there's a structural component here in, in the exhaustion of resources that, yeah. that we've already experienced the, the decline of the economy, the impossibility of the growth rate that we previously had because the real cost of the resources has finally overtaken our ability to get our way out with the technological fix. Yeah. And that once that that's happened, um, we either have a situation where democracy overthrows capitalism, which isn't going to happen, of course, or capitalism yeah. destroys democracy, and in the process, by mechanisms you have described, destroys itself. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, I, I didn't put so much emphasis on the natural resource side. Uh, simply because I don't know enough about it. Uh, I, I, I feel pretty safe on, on labor and, and on, the, uh, on this very crucial issue uh, of uh, containing the extent of time that people have because their, their time is uh, ontologically limited uh, uh, that, that they have to sell to the market. So, so that, that's a problem I understand. I also understand the monetary problem a little better now than, than I used to in the past. Uh, the uh, the natural resources thing. Um, there is this uh, uh, this this question of technological progress that can sort of stretch uh, the available resources. That's very old. Uh, goes back to the discussion about Maltos. Uh, and there, I feel like uh, uh, I'm not as certain as I should be. What I really think is, is the case is that uh, the living, the ways of life of Northern America cannot be extended to the rest of the, of, of the world. That seems to be unchallenged. An, an alternative way of telling your story yeah. is not the end of capitalism, but yeah. that neoliberalism was the destructive yeah. force to set the stage for a very different kind of capitalism, and that global warming will signal the end of neoliberalism. The market is not going to produce seawalls around Manhattan. But capitalism could do very well with a massive expansion of public goods because the contracts to build those seawalls are going to be yeah. private capitalist firms. So you'll have a public works project, yeah. a public works regime, which will be a state-centered capitalism once again. Yeah but which will have global coordination as part yeah. of the state center. Yeah, yeah. But once, um, and, yeah, you know, yeah. and, and I don't see why that isn't reproducible. And it, it, so it's the fact because that, of the cost of resources, yeah. though. No, but the, yeah. so what? Your, your just, resources have become too costly. It's it, not it's that the not pollution costly. is no, no, doing it's not, things. No, no, it's not in. costly if you just uh, use the coercive power of the state to appropriate yeah. this to pay capitalists yeah. to build those things. Yeah, and yeah, so, yeah, yeah, of yeah. course, people will suffer. There'll be. Um, yeah. There'll be a kind of fortress capitalism with an, yeah. a yeah. large excluded population. <coughs> no, the, but that's still capitalism. I, I don't rule this out, but but uh, when I talked yesterday about public, fi this is why public finance interests me so. Uh, and the tendency that you see is is the opposite. It, it is a plundering of the public economy and the public sphere. Right, but since since and elites also learn. No, no, it's that, that <laughs> Hurricane Sandy is a threat to the elites. I mean, yeah. They can substitute private goods for public yeah. education, yeah. but yeah. they can't substitute... Not necessarily. They, they could have been in Manhattan, but... They all moved to Wisconsin, you mean to the inland, and the coasts go... Oh, they, they could also go to Hawaii. Uh, I, I, I think that since they can make, since a lot of money is going to be made out of the public goods, I mean, yeah, the statement no. that it's a public good doesn't mean that the no. public produces it. It's still capitalist firms that built the interstate. Eric, I, I can completely uh, go with you up to this point. And then comes my question, um, how to mobilize these resources in a world in which this obviously leads to a contradiction between uh, 
the growing need for uh, uh, public provision to keep the accumulation process going and the interest of those that uh, benefit from the accumulation process to make it as private as possible. Right. But they will have an interest in raising taxes. My argument would be yeah. that the elites will have an interest in raising taxes when the use of those taxes is for these kinds of purposes. Yeah. For which they will themselves benefit, you know. Yeah, so it's, I, I haven't seen this yet, but well, not, right? But, I, but it it's would. It's, <laughs> well, when, when your scenario is that the alternative is a complete collapse of capitalism, which would not be something they would, because they can't escape that. They no, no. But but then I have the old sort of Marxist conviction that uh, a capitalists are unable uh, to take care of themselves. Uh, to, to rescue themselves. It, it is the story of the, of the working day uh, at the end where uh, the conclusion is... Could you speak on the last Yeah, the, 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 the chapter on the working day is for me a uh, sort of convincing model of discussing this problem. And there essentially what he says is that, or shows in this story, is that capitalists themselves were interested in containing uh, the working day, in, in cutting the work, because they wanted the working class, and, and they were destroying it. But they couldn't do it because they were in competition with each other. They needed the union uh, to force them uh, to impose on themselves a, uh, uh, you, you can say, a Ulysses and the sirens. Uh, but you need something to do this, because they are not smart enough to do this. This is my beneficial constraint. And then I want to see the forces that can impose this on. And since I don't see them, I'm very pessimistic. But I allow you, not because only because you are my friend, but because people like you are important to this, to keep up the hope <laughs> that this may happen. But it is a, it is a hope that is counterfactual. If you look at what has happened in the last 30 or 40 years, this is not, an in, there's no inductive proof. So you can always say, yeah, it was in 40 years, but finally they will wake up. And this is not only possible, but it's also good that you say this, uh, because then they might actually uh, do this. Okay, well on this, um, on this ten division of labor between the pessimism of old Europe and the optimism of the Midwest, <laughs> we will end today, but uh, remember, tomorrow, two hours, of free for all. Anything you want to talk about yes. is on the table. And the reception. the reception. And the reception tonight at 7.30, uh, 2110 Chamberlain. Everybody is invited for a more informal uh, wine and nibbles context for discussing the future of the world. Thank you very much.